So, uh, installing a vagina is something that tends to make your body go, oh no, there's a huge wound here, I better close it as soon as possible. But like, I just paid a lot of money for this wound, so I don't want it to close. Uh, but you know, the human body doesn't usually listen to the human brain, so we need to, you know, do like brute force, which in this case would be, if you give me one second, a thing called uh, a dilator, which is this. This is unused, by the way, so you can stop their cringy faces. <laughs> uh, a dilator is used to dilate uh, the vaginal wall, uh, and if you don't, then it slowly closes down and snaps shut, and this is irreversible, so if this happens, uh, you're screwed, or not. Uh, <laughs> and the human body is very efficient, so Depending on the healing rate of a certain individual, even missing a single day or two early post-op can have uh, catastrophic, irreversible consequences. Uh, now, there is a thing. These aren't sex toys. They're medical devices. Uh, and I could tell you in detail about why, but the thing is, airport security doesn't care. So, one of the countries I traveled to recently, I was explicitly told, you need to put this in checked in luggage, else, if you take it on your person, airport security is going to take it away. And I can't be without this for a single day, and the airport may take it away from me, and I travel a lot. So, it's a scary proposition. So, I was talking to my friends Zoe and Alan, back where I had my surgery, and we decided, we, we figured that a cool thing would be to be able to 3D print them so that, like, you know, if push comes to shove, I can run to a hackerspace, throw money at them and say, hey, print this right away for me. It's not ideal, but it can work. So we decided uh, to figure out how to do that, and we looked into dildogenerator.com, and this has uh, two main issues. One is that this is made for sex toys, uh, which are fundamentally different, you know, like all phallic objects are not the same, chopsticks, Washington monuments, dilators, dildos, uh, all separate. And the other issue is, this is JavaScript, and I'm sure as hell not sticking JavaScript inside my body. <laughs> so... <laughs> So let's do it with Go instead. Uh, now, one caveat is uh, this is going to be a live demo, and 18 minutes is not very much a uh, very long time. So I'm going to cheat and copy some of the boring bits from a text file and stuff, but the important parts we're going to do live. So what are we going to use here? We're going to use one library called SDFX. Uh, it is for SDF, stands for sign distance functions. If you know what that is, please explain it to me. The Wikipedia page is very cryptic. Uh, and in sum, it is used to use algorithms, algori that, okay, never mind, to use code to generate 2D and 3D objects. And the reason we're going to use 2D along with 3D is because sometimes we want to start with a 2D object and extrude it or rotate it or do transformations to generate volume from a 2D object. Uh, now, a 3D object by itself is invisible. It's just shape. You can't see it. So we need to apply light. And for that, we need a renderer, which basically shines light upon it and does crazy math. And then you can see what the thing that, what that shape you did uh, looks like. So we're going to use FOGL. It is uh, pretty simple, pretty easy to use, pretty fast. Uh, it has this name because it's like OpenGL except not, which is cool. And there are fancier renderers like path tracers and stuff, but they take a long time to render, so it's not too good for a live demo. But I'm going to show you what it looks like with a path tracer afterwards. So let's get into code and start this demo and hope it doesn't go up in flames. <laughs> So I'm going to, uh, this. by the way, this is a function that I'm going to skip all the boilerplate, uh, first of all. I'm just going to show you the cool parts. Uh, this is a function that's going to return a 2D and a 3D object, and you're going to have to trust me that magic's going to happen, and it's going to turn into images that we're going to see. So let's get started. I'm going to make a circle by uh, S is the shorthand for the SDF library. So I'm going to make a circle in 2D. It's going to have uh, 20 of, I don't know if it's diameter or radius. And then I'm going to make the 3D version of it, which is going to be a coin. And it's going to be uh, an extrusion. If you don't know when it, what an extrusion is, uh, hold on to your seats. And I'm going to use my circle, and it's going to be 10. 
So my output is now going to be my circle and my coin. And let's hope this works. And you should see the result right here to the side. So I'm ha I have a circle and I have a coin. Pretty revolutionary concepts, I know, but let's keep going. So I can also add, for example, a square. Now this is going to be a box. And it's going to take uh, 2D coordinates. Let's make them, say, 10 and 80. And I don't want smooth edges, so let's give it a 0. And now I can do the same thing again. So I can make a cube. And it's going to be another extrusion. What did I do? And now I can extrude my square by, let's say, 20. 20? No, 30. And now I just need to change my outputs here, because I have two objects on each. So I need to do some unions. So here, union 2D, a circle, and a square. And my output 3D is going to be a union 3D of a cube and a coin. So it merges objects that are on the same coordinates. Uh, and so I'm just going to take the cube and the coin from, I'm going to de-smoosh them so that they're separate. So my cube is going to be. A transformation in 3D, the transformation is going to work on the cube and it's going to have a type of translation, which just means moving it around. This is going to need 3D coordinates and I'm just going to give them some values here. And OK. All right, so now the cube is here, the coin is there. So now you kind of get how this goes. We can add primitives, we can make them into volumes, we can put them in space, move them around, etc. So I'm just going to cheat and I'm going to add some random stuff here that you don't need to waste time watching me type. And now I have a coin too. And I'm just going to change this. And this is going to look slightly creepy, so you may just ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're going to move on to a different concept. And I'm about to explain what it is. I'm just going to put it here first, because I already started typing. So we're going to go into Bezier curves. Now, you, we usually think of 3D modeling as points in space connected by straight lines. But we can, with Bezier, the thing is you can add handles to the points, uh, as they're called, and what they do is you can have direction and weight to these curves. So if you have two points and you connect them with a straight line with Bezier, you can bend how this line works by using those handles. So let's play around with that for a little bit. So I have my Bezier object. I'm going to add some uh, points in space here. I'm going to give it some coordinates. So I'm going to have a point at 0, 0, a point at 50, 150, a point at 0, 300. Now, I need to close this. You always need to close a Bezier curve uh, because. And I'm just going to copy some boilerplate here so that this is going to work. And you don't have to watch me type all that. So let's see if this works. And OK, now we have uh, straight connections to points in space. And so let's now make this uh, through Bezier thing with the handles. So I'm going to take a handle. And this is going to be degrees to radians. 0, a strength of uh, 150. And now you can see it's got a little belly there. So we know that the Bezier thing works. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other end. So it's forward and reverse. I just know that the beginning needs to be one thing, the end needs to be another. And the point in the middle, uh, it is quite sharp now. I'm just going to say, OK, this is a midpoint, so don't uh, you know, add too much to it. OK? And then I can take my 2D object and revolve it around itself to give it volume. So let's see what this is like. And OK, so now I know how to make basic, uh, I call them Bezier blobs. There's probably a more you know, technical name for it, but OK. Uh, and I'm going to play around and add a bunch of them. But I'm going to make a function, because typing all of this is terrible. So I'm just going to take all the relevant numeric values that I added here. And I'm going to make them as arguments. And then I'm going to uh, do a, a translation like this. And I'm going to make these coordinates as arguments as well. So this function, I already have it, already have it here. It's the same stuff I just showed you before, but with all the numbers are now arguments in the function, and it returns a 3D object. So 
now that you know how this works, I'm just going to add a bunch of instances of it here. And let's see what this is going to look like. And I need uh, to add them all together to my output. So kubecoin, coin2, my Bayesian 3D, and all of those guys. There you go. And if this doesn't fail, voila, we have a gopher. <laughs> And just just for kicks, uh, this is what the go for. This is a low poly version. This is a high poly. This is what it looks like with path tracing. So you can see the light looks a, more, a lot more natural. It looks less plasticky. Uh, rendering is an art unto itself. Like on big studios, there's one person who does modeling, the other does rendering. So both can get really specialized. So I'm not going to get into rendering. But here's just so you can see kind of what it uh, would eventually end up looking like. Uh, but the thing is, I didn't start this talk talking about gophers. I started it talking about dilators. So let's get into that. The thing about dilators is uh, the tip here, it has a very delicate, a very special shape. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not just random points in space connected, revolve it, and there you go. There is like a formula to this. And when I say a formula, I mean math. Because I didn't have a first clue how to do this. So I asked a friend of mine who was also looking into it. And she said, oh, you can just use this function. And being completely mathematically illiterate, I looked at this and I was like, yeah, I understand some of those words, like the word computational there, I know what that is. And she took pity on me and she showed me uh, some code. So this is a CAD application. This is a OpenCAD. It's like a CAD programming language. I don't know if you'd call it a programming language or not. I don't much care for it. It's a bit weird, but like, if there's one thing I can do is figure out weird code. Math, not so much. So let's do this. Uh, I spent some time staring at this, like, you know, like staring at the wall, and eventually it made sense by osmosis somehow. And so I'm going to tell you how this kind of works. So we're going to make a function. Uh, I, I'm specifying here my, the length of my dilator, the radius, the number of steps that are going to create like the resolution for the curve. And so the output for the function is going to be x, as long as it is uh, smaller than my radius. And y is never going to be longer than my length, because if I let it, it's going to go to infinity. I just need to figure out that math formula. This thing. So it has two main parts. One is x squared. The other is x divided by the absolute value of radius minus 3. So now that I looked at the code, suddenly this made sense. It didn't before. So I'm just going to write this here. And let's see what it looks like. So part one is uh, x, oops, here, x times x, which is x squared. Part two is, um, what was it? x divided by the absolute value of radius minus x. And now I'm going to need my mathematical superpowers back here. And OK, and then I just add the two together, and that should give me y. So part 1 plus part 2. OK, so let's see what this looks like. And it looks like nothing, because I didn't call this function anywhere. I'm so smart. <laughs> so my output uh, 2D and my output 3D are going to be the result of this function. OK, so it doesn't look exactly ideal. If you zoom in far enough at the tip, you can see that the curve I'm looking for is actually there. Uh, but I'm going to need some tweaks. And I got these tweaks by looking at my friend's code. For example, here, x squared is multiplied by c, which is like an extra variable. Now, I, have, I don't have the first clue how or why this works, but it does. So I'm just going to show you how to add these tweaks. So here, I'm going to multiply this by 0 0.3. And you can see that it's getting better. This gets multiplied by 7. And it's uh, more better, maybe. And here, it's multiplied by 0 0.2. And voila, we have the dilator we were looking for. So I could end this talk here. But then Ben, who works next to me in the office, had the most amazing idea. And when I say amazing, I mean it's either the best or the worst idea ever. And I'm going to try and see your faces to decide which is which. So without further commentary, let's uh, show Ben's idea. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think, let's see if this is it. Nope, it's not. And there you go. <laughs> So now I can put this on a 3D printing website like 3D. <laughs> uh, I've used this before. This website is pretty cool. Uh, you can see here that the dimensions are accurate. If you don't trust me, if the text is too small, here's a banana for scale. <laughs> and uh, here is uh, a version that my friend printed. It is very thick. Uh, I don't know what she's planning to do with it, I'm not going to ask, but it's just so you see that it can be turned successfully into a real object. And uh, you can check out this code on this repo. The version I'm showing you on the demo is very basic. On the repo you have the full thing uh, that runs on a cluster and separate microservices. It uses a uh, garden to make sense of the whole thing. So when you change a file, you save it, it rebuilds our services, redeploys, and you get like this live feedback right away, like we're doing here. It also has a very cool front end, uh, so definitely check it out. And I hope you had a good time here. Feel free to get in touch, and thank you. Thank you.